Um, so uh, let me just start uh, by reminding you uh, what we showed uh, last time. Uh, and then uh, we'll go on uh, to some interesting consequences of what we showed. Uh, so in the last lecture, uh, you know, we proved a, a you know, perhaps surprising a result from some perspective. Uh, we pointed out that in a theory of gravity, uh, there was a sense in which all the information about a state. So if you thought of, we were always considering, uh, so far we've been considering global ADS. And uh, what we proved was that if you considered some copy of global ADS, then all the information about the state available uh, in some small time band, that's of size zero to epsilon. Okay. Uh, this is a surprising result uh, because in general, uh, in a local quantum field theory, uh, this would not be the case. Uh, you know, in a local quantum field theory, uh, you would have to take a Cauchy slice that ran throughout the bulk. And you might have been able to argue in some sense that uh, you know, the information was available uh, in a time that was as large as the light crossing time of ADS. Uh, but when you start having black holes and start having a redshift, that time uh, classically goes to infinity. Uh, so you might have been you know, in a local quantum field here, even then you might have said that the information is available if you take the entire boundary. Uh, but the point was that in a theory of gravity, uh, the information was available already in this small time band. Uh, without having to go to larger and uh, previous times. Uh, now, uh, of course, for those of you who are familiar with, with ADS-CFT, you know, we've known about ADS-CFT for a long time. And of course, uh, this uh, result, uh, you know, one only guessed because one knows ADS-CFT. Uh, so from the point of view of ADS-CFT, uh, this result is, uh, you know, in some sense, kind of obvious uh, because ADS-CFT tells us that, uh, you know, not only information is available, in fact, in less than a time band, it tells us there's a CFT that lives on the boundary uh, and that CFT knows about the entire state in the bulk just on a single time slice. So you don't even have to take a time band, uh, you just take a single time slice. And already if you measure like all CFT operators in that time slice, uh, you know everything uh, about what's happening in the bulk. And it's important that this is the statement of ADS CFT. You know, sometimes uh, and uh, I want to say when, you know, we study ADS CFT and we study correlation functions, uh, we sometimes say, you know, we'll specify data on the boundary of ADS and then we'll solve some partial differential equations to come inside. Uh, but, you know, that is something that works even without gravity. The surprising part of ADS CFT, the surprising information theoretic part of ADS CFT is that at a single time slice, uh, the boundary has information about all of the bulk. Uh, and uh, so, you know, from that point of view, it's quite clear that, you know, if you were to measure like all operators uh, near the boundary in this time from zero to epsilon, uh, they would have all information about the bulk. Uh, of course, uh, the, you know, as I emphasized last time, uh, when we proved our result, we didn't invoke ADS CFT and we just invoked some properties of gravity. And we said that, you know, if you grant some properties of gravity, which we made precise, uh, you can prove uh, this result. Uh, so what I want to do uh, today is that, you know, it might have seemed uh, that in the last lecture, we were making these uh, uh, arguments about operator algebras and for Neumann algebras and, uh, you know, uh, a, the whole thing might have seemed a little bit uh, abstract uh, or, you know, a slightly formal. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that might be a little dissatisfying because, you know, in a, in a sense, we know the result that we are going to get uh, from ADSAFT and but then, you know, we make some formal arguments trying to justify why that's the case. And that might seem a little dissatisfying. And so what I want to do today is I want to explain that this is not a formal result, uh, but that this is something which one can really test. Uh, I mean, not really test in an experiment, but uh, test at least in terms of a thought experiment in that if one just considers low energy effective field theory, uh, these effects that we described last time uh, have a concrete consequence. Okay? Uh, so I want to consider the following setup. Uh, which is similar to the setup last time, but I'll, I'll make some simplifications. Uh, and uh, so let's go back to global ADS. And uh, in global ADS, uh, we have some state, okay? So maybe there's some state of some uh, particles. Uh, you can uh, see these green particles inside. So there's some state, there's some excitation that lives in, in the middle of global ADS. And near the boundary of ADS, we have some observers uh, who live near the boundary of ADS. So there are some astrophysicists uh, who live here. Okay. Uh, so we have some astrophysicists and there's actually a group of astrophysicists. So they live in, uh, not on one part of the boundary, but they have detectors or, you know, they have a group of friends who surrounds the entire boundary. 
Uh, but uh, these astrophysicists, on one hand, are much more powerful than Earth-based astrophysicists because they can measure, I mean, as we'll see, uh, they'll have to measure like uh, Planck scale fluctuations uh, because they'll have to use quantum gravity effects. Uh, so, you know, uh, even if you can't do it in real life, we are free to give these astrophysicists the power to do this in this thought experiment. Uh, but they have an important limitation. They have these very sensitive detectors, uh, but it's a little like uh, Cinderella, I guess, that the detectors stop working after time epsilon. Okay. So they start working at time zero and they stop working at time epsilon. Okay. So we have these astrophysicists. Uh, and with very sensitive detectors. So, you know, uh, they have this gift of having these detectors that work very well in that they can detect Planck length fluctuations. But these detectors, you know, after time epsilon, they turn back into pumpkins or whatever. So they don't, they don't work. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so now the question is, uh, can these astrophysicists determine uh, the state that lives in the bulk? Okay, so that's the question uh, that we want to ask. So, uh, can they determine the bulk state? Okay. Now, uh, we are going to make some simplifications. Okay. Uh, we don't want to, in this lecture, or at least, I mean, uh, in, in this part of the lecture, uh, we want to work within low energy effective field theory. Uh, so, we are going to say that this is also a low energy excitation. So this state inside is not a black hole. You know, it's not some, some black hole state or some very complicated state. Uh, it's a low energy excitation, right? So, you know, maybe it's some collection of some gravitons. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you, you, we can think of some string theoretic excitations, but uh, it's not some excitation where, you know, uh, gravitational effects have become strongly coupled and perturbation theory has broken down. And, you know, you need to, you need to think of something much more complicated or non-perturbative. Uh, so we don't want to, you know, we don't want to think of states of this kind. Uh, so the bulk state is low energy okay? and the fact that this is low energy will correspond uh, also to some powers that we will give this astrophysicist. Okay? Uh, so uh, just to be clear, I hope the setup is clear. You know, we have some state which maybe you can think of to be concrete as a gas of gravitons uh, and these astrophysicists are asked to determine uh, what the state is. And they're told ahead of time that it's not a very complicated state. Okay? In fact, uh, we should make this a little bit precise. Uh, it's important to make this precise because, uh, you know, even in local quantum field theories, uh, there is no such thing as an absolutely, you know, as a localized state, which has no high energy components. Uh, you know, you can easily check that if you act with a unitary that's strictly localized, that has compact support, uh, just by the uncertainty principle, it will have some support on arbitrarily high Fourier components. And so we don't want to demand that the state has no high energy components. But rather, we want to demand the following. Let me just try and make it precise. Let's call this state G. So this is the global state they need to characterize. Okay. Uh, and what they are told ahead of time is that is the following that they're given. They said, you know, that there's some UV cutoff, which is much below the Planck scale, uh, but they're told the following. Okay. So Let's say you take the state and you project those components of the state that have less energy than this UV cutoff. Okay. And you ask, what is the norm of the state of the part of the state that has less energy than this UV cutoff? Uh, then we are going to demand that, you know, this norm uh, is almost one. Uh, so said otherwise, you know, the state could have some high energy components. And that's important because we want the state to have like localized excitations. Uh, which in LQFT, these observers near the boundary could not see. Uh, but uh, these high energy components are small in norm, and this is the sense in which they're small in norm. And the astrophysicists are told what this lambda is. So this is a UV cutoff. Okay. Uh, it's some cutoff which they're told about. And this P, uh, E smaller than lambda, is a projector onto energy smaller than lambda. So I hope uh, the setup is clear. Uh, they have a, a low energy state. Uh, what I've written below is just the definition of what one means by low energy state. Uh, and they're told that, uh, you know, uh, so they, this they're given ahead of time. And then they're asked to characterize the state. Okay. Uh, so now before we, we go ahead and try and see if they can, if they can do this task with the detectors they're given, 
I have to tell you a little bit more about uh, what they have access to. Uh, so I'm going to allow them access to uh, a textbook uh, quantum mechanics abilities. Okay. So let me remind you what what are we allowed to do when we first learn quantum mechanics, right? If you first learn the stern girdlock experiment uh, and you think of some particles operating in the magnetic field, uh, what is it that you're allowed to do with those particles? Uh, so there are always two things that you're allowed to do. The first is that you know, you're allowed to maybe turn on some magnetic fields and rotate the particles. And that corresponds to some unitary transformation of the state. Okay? Uh, so that's always something uh, that you're allowed to do. And the second thing you're allowed to do that, you know, when we discuss quantum mechanics is you're allowed to make measurements. Okay? So those are the only two abilities we are going to give these, these observers. Okay? So in particular, if X is a low energy operator, near the boundary, the boundary, or more precisely, you know, when I say near the boundary, I always mean at the boundary and in the time band zero to epsilon. Zero to epsilon, okay. Uh, so we'll allow, so if X is such a low energy op uh, operator, uh, then we allow the observers to act with with e to the i j x. Okay, so this is a unitary. Remember, uh, as we emphasized last time, uh, you're never allowed to act with a Hermitian operator. Okay, if you're allowed to act with Hermitian operators, uh, you could do many remarkable things, uh, even in uh, just quantum mechanics. Uh, but you're never allowed to act with a Hermitian operator. But we are going to allow them to act with a unitary operator, which is u is equal to e to the i j x. Okay. So in particular, we'll allow them to make the transformation of state g to e to the i g x, i j x into g. Okay? So remember this g that we are using, like this g here, uh, this g will always is the state in which the observers find themselves. So that's the state they need to characterize. Uh, and they're allowed to transform the state by acting with this unit tree. So they're allowed to do this kind of an operation. And second, uh, we'll allow them to make measurements. Uh, in fact, the only measurement we are going to allow them to make is they can measure the energy. Okay. Now, this is actually a pretty important point. Uh, they can measure the energy, but you know, the way they measure the energy is not by going into the bulk and by determining what the energy is by seeing what the excitations are in the bulk. So they can measure the energy using gravitational effects. So they measure, measure the energy the way we measure the energy of the sun. So they, they have to live near the boundary. They have a set of detectors and they can measure the energy using gravitational effects. And this is why it's important that their detectors are very sensitive uh, because you know the reason we can measure the energy of the sun is because the sun has a lot of mass and it affects the gravitational field near the planets. And so you can see what it does. Uh, but uh, this G that we are going to talk about is going to be a G that has you know maybe cosmological scale uh, energies. And therefore, the fact that these observers can measure the energy tells us that they have to be sensitive to Planck scale fluctuations. Because if you take you know, some, some quantum mechanical excitation in the bulk, uh, even to measure its energy using gravitational effect requires us uh, to be sensitive to these Planck scale fluctuations. And of course, you know, that has to be part of the story because what we're saying is some property of quantum gravity. And therefore, we are allowing them the ability to measure the energy, but measure the energy using the integral of the boundary metric that we wrote down last time. If you remember, uh, we wrote down this integral of the boundary metric. Uh, and this was the, the subleading component of the metric. Uh, we had to take some limit. You had to scale it up by r to the d minus 2. Uh, but after you did that, if you took the integral of the subleading component of the metric, that gave you the energy. And these observers can measure that. So these are the two abilities that they have. Okay. Uh, I see there are some questions. How exactly is a low energy operator defined? Uh, so the question is, how exactly is a low energy? A low energy operator is just an, an operator which has energy less than this UV cutoff lambda. Uh, and this UV cutoff lambda is much smaller than N. Okay, so it's, it's, it's in our hand actually to define uh, what we mean by low energy. Uh, but uh, we mean that uh, you, know, you have a UV cutoff, um, which is, you put a UV cutoff, uh, maybe you can put it at string scale or at some other scale. Uh, this cutoff is much smaller than N. Remember at the beginning, I said N was where the Planck scale appeared. And uh, you know, so that's what we mean by low energy. Uh, they measure some energies that are much lower than Planck scale. And that's important because no black holes appear if the energy of the excitation in the bulk is less than Planck scale. 
the uh, the other thing I should say is that these X's are low energies, but maybe I should I should also specify they're also simple operators. So you know, low energy is not enough because sometimes you might be able to take a low energy operator and take a very complicated polynomial that somehow has low energy because it has a small commutator with the Hamiltonian. Uh, so here we are talking about operators which you know wherein where by simple we mean the same thing in that you know you take some some graviton fields and you try and construct polynomials and you never insert a polynomial of degree higher than lambda where lambda is the the cutoff that we discussed uh, just now okay okay uh, so i hope this is clear and i hope uh, this is rather uncontroversial that they allowed uh, these these two abilities okay so before we we go on to this question of whether they can characterize the state g uh, i want to explain a warm up task Okay, so okay. can I ask a question? Another question. Yes, yeah. Uh, ju just to be precise, uh, n, if, if I remember correctly, n is a pure number, right? Uh, so maybe lambda much smaller than n. We need some other scale in that uh, relation. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so all scales are measured in terms of the ADS scale. So all energy scales are, oh, are pointed okay. at, in terms of the ADS. So n is a pure number. Uh, but n, uh, uh, I was using, you know, is the ratio of the Planck scale to the ADS scale. So energy much smaller than n means energy much smaller than Planck scale. So we use Perfect. the ADS scale to, to scale out all energies. Okay, good. Are there any other questions? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, can you please repeat uh, and the condition regarding the projector of it? I, I somehow missed that. Yeah, the condition was just this. Yeah, you know, the uh, the condition was that when we say it's a low energy state, uh, we don't mean it doesn't have any high energy components. Uh, you know, if you if we say that a state has no high energy components, you can't think of any localized excitation. If I think of a some localized lump of the field, which is like localized in this room, uh, it'll actually have some excitations which are high energy, and that's just by the uncertainty principle. You know, if it's localized in this room, you Fourier transform it, uh, you will get you will get some excitations which are arbitrarily high energy. And so what we want to say, you know, when we say the it's a low energy excitation, what we really mean is that, you know, there is some very low probability that if you measure the energy, you'll find high energy. Uh, but what we mean is that that probability is small. So th this is the condition that's written here. Uh, can you see below? It's the statement that you take the state G and you project it onto its low energy parts lower than some UV cutoff. And that's almost all the state. So, you know, it means that, that if you write the state G as uh, some low energy, uh, then you could have some small part, you know, so you, you could have like square root one minus epsilon plus uh, some square root epsilon into high energy, uh, but this is far, this is small. So, you know, it's not that there are no high energy tails, uh, but, but, you know, there, there's, there could be high, small high energy tails. We don't rule them out completely, but this is most of it. Okay. So most of the state lives in this, in this low energy part. Okay. So that's what this condition below makes precise. What I wrote here schematically and imprecisely uh, this condition below uh, makes that precise. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. So let's start with the warm-up task. Okay. So let's 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 start with a very simple task. Let's ask them to determine is G equal to zero or not. So is it is it the global ADS vacuum or is it not? So this sounds like a very simple task, but uh, I just want to, uh, I, I want you all to pause and recognize that even this task is impossible in a local quantum field theory. Okay. It's impossible in an LQFT. And in fact, this is, you know, it, it, it's such a simple point, but this point I think already brings out uh, the fact that gravity stores information so differently uh, from a local quantum field theories. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, just recognize that if I have a local quantum field theory okay, uh, and uh, I have these observers who live here between zero to epsilon, and let's say I act with a unitary operator on the state here. Okay? So in an LQFT, all correlators in this time band are unchanged in an LQFT. Okay. Uh, what that means is that if you take, if you consider this unitary operator U, you know, if you consider the state, then this is exactly the same in an LQFT, okay. where X is any operator, any operator near the boundary. 
I want to emphasize that this is actually, and you know, this this is this is an important fact. And the reason this is an important fact is because you know, remember we we talk. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard so much discussion of entanglement in the vacuum, right? Uh, so you often talk about the entanglement in a local quantum field theory of different parts of space with each other when the entire state is in the vacuum. Okay? And sometimes, you know, people also write papers trying to talk about the same quantity in ADS. Uh, and in a local quantum field theory, it's something that makes sense. And the reason it makes sense is because of this is because, you know, if when you talk about entanglement in the vacuum, there is some sense in which there is information which is separate here in this green region, which and there's some information which is separate in the middle of ADS. And if you were to act with a unitary operator in the middle of ADS, you can't determine it in the green region. And therefore, you can meaningfully talk about the entanglement of the green part of the slice with the rest of ADS uh, because you know they contain different uh, amounts of information and there's a sense in which the space factorizes. Okay? And we can talk about this already in, uh, you know, in when the state is the vacuum. So even when the state is the vacuum, by measuring correlators in the green part in a local quantum field theory, you cannot determine uh, what uh, you know uh, whether it's the vacuum or whether it is u times zero. Uh, so I hope uh, this is clear. So already, you know, this task that we are giving the observers, uh, they cannot perform in a local quantum field theory. And as I emphasized last time, uh, they also cannot perform this task uh, in a gauge theory. They can't perform this task in a gauge theory. Because in a gauge theory, there is a sense in which you could act with a local Wilson loop operator. This U could be a local Wilson loop operator. And there is no way uh, from the boundary uh, you would be able to tell if you had acted with U or not. Okay, okay great. Um, so uh, so now, yeah. there's actually a question by Akhil in the chat. Um, can you read it? Or? Independent local entanglement saying high energy levels are empty. Uh, Ahil, I, I don't understand this question at all. We argued for state independent local entanglement saying high energy levels are empty. So is there a bound in the high energy projection? Uh, maybe you can ex uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, so when we argued for the, how the local entanglement should uh, should be uh, same as in the vacuum, we said it's independent of the state, right? So isn't, it's uh, independent of the state. Uh, said, sorry, in, in the are you asking about- When we derive the uh, two point functions across the horizon and so on, we argued for uh, we argued argued that uh, local oh local entanglement. entanglement in that sense oh you mean like uh, uh, of close of two uh, close low energy degrees of freedom yes yes right yes right. so that that still props the high energy compound of the state right if you look at uh, the two that lock, very close uh, excitations are entangled uh, sorry I, i'm not understanding the relevance uh, to what we are talking about now you're right that if you start measuring like very low energy excitations, uh, we probe the high energy component. But remember, uh, there we we emphasize that we are never going to probe anything at Planck scale or higher. So it was high energy compared to ADS, uh, but it was low energy compared to Planck scale. Uh, so everywhere yeah, so, we are so, saying so, low energy uh, here. I'm yeah. saying I'm still saying low energy compared to the cutoff. There also we were saying uh, because I mean you're always probing local entanglement with uh, some some cutoff length. Uh, oh, okay, and, uh, sorry. Can I can I just ask what is the relevance of the question to what we're discussing here? I was I was asking if uh, whether this projection you mentioned the projection is much smaller. This epsilon you mentioned uh, in the last slide. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's and, a projection. Yeah. Go on. And 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 there you were able to argue that the correction should be over exponential s or whatever. So I was just asking, is there a similar statement you can ask make about epsilon here? Yeah, yeah. So, so the fact that epsilon is, you know, is is the 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 fact that this is a low energy state means the following. Okay, it means that the state is maybe some some component plus zero. So they're excited states. Remember, in ADS plus something times one, plus something times two with some coefficients. And this series, you know, largely terminates at some order, which could be you know ten thousand. Uh, so remember, there are these discrete energy levels in ADS. Uh, you have some energy level one, two, three, and so on. And N is like very, very, very large. Okay. So all we're saying here is that uh, the state that you're looking at is a state which is energy lower than, than, you know, than arbitrarily high energy. So it's some state where most of the energy is, is combined. And you could take this energy to be much larger than the ADS scale. So there's nothing saying that this lambda has to be small in order one units. I mean, you could take lambda to be like, you know, uh, 10 to the 10 and you could take n could still be 10 to the 30 and you would still have a huge gap between lambda and n. Uh, so or we're not saying anything very complicated here. We're just saying that, you know, you have, if you have a gas of gravitons, that's a good example for the kind of state we're looking at. Okay. So think of a, 
any state in the Fox space, you make some gas of like 10 gravitons, that's already a good example. Oh, okay. Okay, for the I, was actually, I, I, was, I was actually, I was kind of anticipating you would need to estimate this uh, epsilon for some argument you're going to make. So. Well, okay, uh, if you, right, so then you can ask later. We, we okay, will not okay, need sure. it for anything. Yeah. Okay. Right, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so, so uh, great. So now, now the, so going back to this thing. So we are right now just doing a warm up task, which is this task. You know, is D equal to the vacuum or is it not? Okay. Uh, and as I said already in the local quantum field theory, this task is impossible. So if the observers are living in the, you know, don't have access to gravity, they can't do it. Uh, but let me explain how it's very simple to do this task in gravity. So in gravity, it's a one step process. Measure the energy. Measure the energy. By the Born rule, uh, you know, when you measure the energy, uh, remember when we measure the energy, we measure the energy not as in the expectation value of the energy, but we are going to do, you know, we are, we are allowed to, you know, you measure the energy and by the standard rules of quantum mechanics, which you learn uh, in, in textbook quantum mechanics, you can get different results when you measure the energy. And what we need to measure is what is the probability that this energy result is zero? Of getting zero. So this, remember, is one of the abilities we allow the observers to have. We allow them to uh, measure the energy. They measure the energy. The energy is a quantum mechanical observable. Uh, it follows the same, uh, you know, it's, they're just measuring some component of the metric, follows the same rules as, as other components of the, the metric do. We are in low energy effective field theory, follows the same rule as other observables do. And they just need to determine the probability that they get zero. And what is this probability? You see, this probability is what we discussed last time. It's the Again, this is just, you know, it's the, this is just the Born rule. This probability is given by the projector on the vacuum and the expectation of that projector in the state G. But remember the vacuum in global ADS is unique. And therefore this expression that we have here is just mod of zero G squared. So if this is one, if one, then G is equal to zero. Okay. Okay. And if it's not, otherwise G is not zero. Okay. So notice, uh, and I want to emphasize, this is such a simple example, but this already brings out the fact that the observers can distinguish, they can distinguish between G between zero and what you might have thought was a local unitary acting on zero. So you might have thought, you know, I'll act with some local operator that will act in the middle of ADS. Uh, but in fact, the operator that you're acting with is not going to be really localized. As we discussed, there's no such thing as a gauge invariant local operator uh, in the theory of gravity. And in fact, uh, you can see that from the fact that these observers, just by measuring the energy and determining the probability of getting zero, can distinguish between these states, which was impossible in the local quantum field theory. Okay. So this warm-up task already actually brings out uh, one example of how gravity stores information very differently. In particular, it tells you that you know if you if you see a paper which talks about the entanglement of and the inside of ADS or inside of some ball with the outside of some ball in the vacuum uh, in a theory of gravity. Uh, then there's already uh, something which is, uh, you know, which, which one needs to be careful about because you see that by making a measurement outside, you can already determine the entire state of what is happening inside. Okay? I emphasize that you have to measure the entire outside. You know, when we're talking about the energy, these observers have to have a team, as I said, that spreads out all over the boundary of ADS and makes a measurement and then adds up their results. Okay? So if the observers were just confined to one part of ADS, like one side or the other side, they would not be able to de determine uh, this P0. And so it's important that these observers are spread out all throughout, and that's what allows them to determine this. Uh, but this already is something that was not possible uh, in a local quantum field theory. Okay, uh, let's do a second warm up task uh, for fun. So, you know, sometimes uh, you might have said, well, okay, fine, you know, you did this, which was different in gravity, but you cheated. Uh, you cheated because, you know, you, you took a state zero, uh, this vacuum state, which is uniquely characterized uh, by some conserved charge. You know, there's some conserved charge, uh, which is the energy. And the energy you know, uniquely characterizes the state and we know you can measure charges and that's why you, know, you were able to determine uh, that the state was zero. Uh, but uh, let me give you a harder task. Okay? So let's take a second warm up task. So let's take, take a second task. Uh, so let's let X 
be a, one of these simple low energy Hermitian operators, okay? So a simple low energy Hermitian operator near the boundary. And let me introduce the notation, which I'll use for uh, uh, the rest of this uh, lecture, which is that X is X acting on zero. I emphasize that, you know, we don't allow the observers to actually act with X on zero, but this is just, uh, uh, you know, use of language X acting on zero. Uh, but this is what we'll call the state X. Okay? Uh, now we already discussed the action of such operators in some detail. And in fact, this is a very general class of states. Uh, it's a very general class of states and already gives you a basis for all these low energy states in the theory. Okay? That's because as we emphasized, uh, there's this version of this Riesz leader theorem, which is if you take an op Hermitian operator near the boundary, and remember by near the boundary, I always mean at boundary and in time band zero to epsilon. Uh, I keep saying near the boundary because you know you could do the same thing morally, as I said, by working at time zero and going out a little bit into the bulb. Uh, but whenever I say near boundary, you should always mentally substitute if I forget to say that what we really mean is you take an operator at the boundary in this time band. And as we emphasize, this set of states already forms a basis for the entire Hilbert space. So it's a rather general set of states. Uh, because we've made a restriction to Hermitian operators here, we actually cannot get all low energy states. And we'll come back to that in a minute because when we, when we prove this Riesz leader theorem, we actually said if you take the set of all low energy simple operators near the boundary, you can generate all low energy states in, in the Hilbert space. Uh, but um, you know, here we are restricting to Hermitian operators. And so you only get a basis, you don't get all states. Uh, but fine, X could be one such state. And this X in particular could be some gas of gravitons in the bulk or some such general state. Uh, and now uh, we'll ask the observers to determine is G equal to X okay, or not. Okay. So they now need to determine if this state that they live in, if it's equal uh, to the state X, uh, some state X, which you give them, uh, or if it's not, okay. Uh, and uh, this is different a little bit from the previous example because X is not necessarily characterized by a conserved charge. So it's not characterized by a conserved charge. And so in that sense, uh, you know, this state, uh, you might've thought that this is a harder problem uh, that they need to do. And of course, uh, needless to say, uh, you know, in an LQFT, this is impossible. X and UX, or let me call it U bulk X, are indistinguishable, where by U bulk X, I mean some, some a uh, unitary operator that acts in the middle of ADS, which is separated space-like from the time band from zero to epsilon. So these are indistinguishable. Okay. So needless to say, this task is also impossible in a local quantum field theory, uh, but uh, we are now going to explain how these observers can do this in a theory of gravity. Okay. So we have to follow the following two-step process. So first you act with e to the i jx. So this is one of the operations that was allowed, right? And then, so in gravity, they follow the following two-step process and then measure energy and determine the probability that you get zero. So first you make a manipulation and then measure the energy. So let's see why this two-step process uh, will allow them to extract, uh, determine whether the state is X or not, okay? So in the first step, what happens? In the first step, so in the step one, this G goes to E to the I JX times G. Okay, so they're, remember they're in some state G, they act with this E to the I JX. Uh, so they can do that by turning on some source near the boundary that's dual to this X. Uh, and they act with this and G gets transformed uh, by this unit to the operator to E to the I J X times G. Okay. And then they measure the energy. So when they measure the energy, the result of step two is G E to the minus I J X P zero E to the I J X G. Okay. Uh, there's a simplification I should have mentioned, uh, which I'm going to assume uh, in the algebra right now. And I'll come back to that later. So we'll assume uh, we also tell the observers 
uh, or you know they can determine themselves by doing an experiment that g on zero is zero okay so g is not the vacuum in fact it's orthogonal to the vacuum it has some excitations uh, you know maybe it's the first plus second plus third plus tenth plus ten thousandth excited state uh, but g doesn't have any component to the vacuum and in fact the observers can themselves do an experiment using the first step that we mentioned and determine if g on zero is zero or if it's not zero uh, so i'll use this simplification in the algebra that follows and under this assumption we want to evaluate this quantity okay so i'm going to do some simple algebra and uh, let's do the, some simple algebra and see what happens uh, so let's just take this quantity that we have here and let's just expand it out to order j squared Uh, so here's the quantity uh, we want to expand, and now I'm just going to expand it out to j squared. So it's totally straightforward. Times zero, zero, one plus i j x plus j squared x squared by two times g. Okay. So I hope everyone is with me till this point. Okay, and then there are order j cube terms, which we are not going to be interested in. Uh, because the observers are allowed to act with e to the i j x, they can act with e to the i j x many times, and they can determine what the order one, the order j, the order j squared term is. Okay. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, everyone is, uh, this is a very simple algebra. I just expanded out the unitary uh, to uh, second order on both sides. And now let's just see what happens uh, to, to these, these terms. Notice that g on zero, is equal to zero by assumption. I mean, by assumption or by using the first form up task, they determined this to be the case. Uh, but now, therefore, notice how these terms contract. You see, when this one contracts uh, with this with a zero, and if you try and pick up the one term here, you try and ask what is the order one term here, you could only pick that up by taking this one and contracting it with this zero and taking this one and contracting it with this zero. But if you did that, you would end up contracting this G with the zero and this G with the zero here, right? So therefore there is no order one term. There is no order one term because G on zero, you know, the order one term is G zero times zero G uh, and that's zero, okay? So the order one term is zero. I hope that's clear from here, uh, from just from doing the algebra, okay? And now what about the, the order J term? You see the order J term is also zero because the order one term is zero on both sides, right? So you see, you can't get an order J term because if you try to pick up the J term from here, you would get a non-zero term from this contraction. But if you picked up an order J term from here, you would have to pick up an order one term from this part. And that's not possible because you know the one, if the one hits the zero and you hit the G on the other side, you're going to get zero. So the order J term, which actually, you know, looks like J X times zero times minus I times zero G plus some Hermitian conjugate. This is also zero because of this expression that appears here. So the first term that appears is the J squared term. Okay. What's the J squared term? The J squared term is when you contract the J X with this G here and you contract this jx, you pick up this term from here. Notice that the j squared term does not receive a contribution from this j squared x squared and the one here, because once again, g on zero is one. Okay. So you, you don't need to, for at the order j squared level, you don't need to worry about this j squared x squared or this j squared x squared. You only need to worry about the term, which is just g times j times x times zero times zero times j times x times g. And there's some factors of i that actually just cancel out. And this term is just j squared times x times gx mod squared. So this expression that we have is actually just equal to this term plus order j cube terms. So this is the final answer that we have. G zero e to the i j x on g is equal to j squared into g x mod squared plus order j cube. So you see that at order j squared we extract immediately the overlap of g with x. So if this order j squared term, if by measuring this order j squared term the observers find that this is one, they know g is equal to x. Otherwise, they know it's not equal to x. 
Okay. So you see that by this simple two-step process, the observers in a theory of gravity can not only determine if the state is the vacuum, but they can also determine if the state is any given state produced by the action of a Hermitian operator uh, near the boundary on the vacuum. Okay. Uh, and that follows from this very simple algebra uh, that I have just done for you. Uh, are there any questions uh, here? Uh, uh, I can take them now uh, and then because, you know, this actually is the key part. The rest of it is just a few details, which I'll go on for. Yeah, so there's one question in the chat. He's asking if uh, if the asymptotic observers could also measure soft charges if they did exist in ADS. Yeah, so these soft charges is not a complication we need to deal with. Uh, we'll start talking about it maybe towards the end of this lecture, next lecture, because we're in global ADS. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, these IR effects are not there. So we don't have a sense in which you need to worry about these soft uh, modes. You know, there's an infrared cutoff, which is set by the ADS scale. Uh, great. What about, what about the case where G is not orthogonal to the vacuum? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, just one, one okay. minute, please. I'll come, okay. I'll come to that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question? Okay, okay, fine. So let, let me go on. In fact, we are, we are almost, so now let's go back to the, the full task, okay. In fact, we are almost done. Uh, we, we, are, we are almost done. Uh, uh, and that's uh, for the following reason. Uh, actually, maybe before I go on to the full task, I should explain uh, this part about, uh, well, okay. Uh, we, we, okay, uh, uh, let, let, let me just say a few things and then I'll come to this issue of what if it's not orthogonal to vacuum. Uh, you know, when we come to the full task, we are almost done. Uh, because, uh, you know, if you could measure gx, the whole squared, uh, for x uh, ranging over a basis, uh, you're, uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain now why you can determine, in fact, what g is entirely. Uh, but before uh, we, uh, we, we go to that, uh, you know, one question you might have had in mind is that, you know, x is produced by the action of some low energy operator near the boundary acting on the vacuum. Uh, you know, we said last time that the action of low energy operators near the boundary acting on the vacuum was dense in the full Hilbert space. Uh, can't I just directly, you know, measure the overlap of G with any state in the Hilbert space? Uh, and that's uh, not possible because of what I said a few minutes earlier, the fact that X is permission. So X ranges only over a basis, uh, over a basis. Okay. And you can see that, right? Because you might have some state X uh, and you might uh, try and think of the state X plus I Y, where Y is the same. It's, it's another operator that acts near the boundary on the vacuum. And you see, if you look at X plus I Y, uh, this is indeed produced by the action of an X plus I Y acting on the vacuum. And this is a simple low energy operator near the boundary, but this is not a Hermitian operator. And therefore, you know, you might have said, why can't I act with the source with, which is e to the i j into x plus i y, but you're not allowed to do that because that's not a unitary operation. And, you know, we, we promised we'll stick to the rules of quantum mechanics, where you're only allowed to act with unitary operators. And therefore, you're not directly allowed to measure the overlap of g with x plus i y. And therefore, you can only measure the overlap of g with the set of states, uh, you know, which is obtained by acting with Hermitian operators, which is clearly a basis. So, you know, if you're allowed to act with x and you can get the state y, that gives you a basis for the two-dimensional Hilbert space, uh, but you don't get uh, the all states in the Hilbert space. Uh, so that's one uh, complication, uh, which we'll have to deal with. Uh, the second complication is that, in fact, uh, you know, even when I said you could measure G on mod X, the whole squared, uh, I assumed in the previous slide, it was asked that G was orthogonal to the vacuum. And in general, you know, when we try and do this full task of characterizing G, G may not be orthogonal to the vacuum. Right? So the point is that if it is not orthogonal to the vacuum, so if it is the case that G on zero is not equal to zero, uh, then what the observers need to do is they need to act with some preliminary unitary U, which takes G to UG, so that this new state is orthogonal to the vacuum, okay? Now, why is it, uh, how can you construct such a preliminary unitary? Uh, it's in fact not hard uh, to see. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the references, uh, uh, you can see uh, how to construct such a unitary. 
Uh, but let me just try and physically motivate why it's very easy to construct such unitary. You see, if you just think of the state as characterized in low energy effective field theory, uh, you would have thought that you know there are some there are local degrees of freedom uh, that live in all places. Of course, we ex I have explained to you that in gravity the situation is more complicated. Uh, but you know there are uh, within uh, the low energy approximation uh, within the quantum field theory the Fox space approximation uh, there are degrees simple harmonic degrees of freedom you can extract from local regions of the Hilbert space, and because you can extract these simple harmonic degrees of freedom from local regions of the Hilbert space you can act with local unitaries that maybe act on only one part of the boundary or maybe act on only another part of the boundary. And all you need to do to make two states orthogonal is rotate one of these degrees of freedom by the right phase uh, so that the states become orthogonal. So, you know, making states orthogonal is actually very easy. It's very easy because almost anything you do, you know, you just take one qubit and you, and you rotate it, uh, you'll get something that's, that's orthogonal. Uh, or, you know, you, you add some energy, you put some excitations in one place, uh, and you'll get a state that's orthogonal to any other given state. Uh, so uh, you can show, in fact, that it's always possible to find some local unitary operator made out of the same near boundary operators, uh, so that if G on zero was not zero, uh, you can act with such an operator and make it zero. Okay? And then you can, you know what this unitary was, and you can determine, you know, as I explain now, you can characterize the state U on G, and therefore you can back calculate also what G was in the first place. Okay? So in general, if, the, if you start, if the observers find, and they can find by make this warm up task one, whether G has an overlap with the vacuum or not, if it does have an overlap with the vacuum, what they need to do is act with some preliminary unitary uh, so as to make uh, G orthogonal to the vacuum. After that, so we'll assume it has been done. Okay, so I'm going to assume that, that this has been done. Okay. So the observers have, have done, uh, have performed this step. Uh, so and so that g on zero is zero, uh, and after this, you see th now they can measure, and I'll just call this g. Okay, so I, I instead of talking about u g, I'll just call this. I'll just redefine my notation to say this is g. Uh, but keep in mind that if the original g was not orthogonal to vacuum, you need to do this preparatory step. So now they can measure. gx the whole squared where x runs over a basis okay. okay so now the question is how do they find the phases right if i just tell you mod of gx the whole squared when x runs over a basis that's not enough to determine the full state g you also need to find the phase of g of x and uh, the protocol that we explained right now gives you the mod squared okay. so how do you find the phase so to find the phase, uh, we do the following. Uh, we pick our favorite operator, low energy operator, let's call it XR. So we just pick some operator depending on what, what the observers like, uh, you know, uh, there's some, some operator they pick. And we just declare that GXR is real. Why are we allowed to declare that GXR is real? We are allowed to declare that GXR is real because the overall phase of G can never matter. Okay? So GXR is, is, is real is always a declaration we can make because nothing can depend on the overall phase of G. That's just the standard rule of quantum mechanics. So I can always say that, you know, I want to choose a convention where the state I'll characterize is such that it's overlap on a particular basis state, which I have picked. Uh, this XR corresponds to a particular basis state that I picked. It corresponds to this operator XR that this overlap is real. So that I'm free to do. That's just a choice of convention. But now, now that I have done that, notice that X plus XR is also Hermitian. Right? Because if X is Hermitian, XR is Hermitian, X plus XR is also Hermitian. So using this protocol, the observers can also determine gx plus g of x are the whole squared. Okay. And the way they do this is using exactly what I said previously. You act with e to the i j into x plus x r and then measure p0. Right. So using this two-step process, this gives them mod of g of x plus x r the whole squared. 
Now, if you act, with, if you know mod of g plus of x plus x r the whole square, you see uh, you're you're in pretty good shape because this, if you just expand it out, this is just equal to so my equal to comes from here from the top. Uh, this is just equal to mod of g x the whole squared plus g of x r the whole squared. Uh, here I don't need a mod because this is real, and then this is just twice into g of x r into the real part of g of x. Uh, I hope you see that. You see that you know because x r is real, and so if I expand out a real number plus this complex number which is g of x. Uh, you see, you will get, you know, you will get mod of z squared or mod of g of x the whole squared, uh, plus you'll get this guy, and then you will get, you know, this times this complex conjugate, and this times this complex conjugate, but this complex conjugate is the same because g of x r is just a real number, and therefore you'll get twice of g of x r times the real part of g of x. Okay. Now this can be determined. This is independent. This can be independently determined because you remember this is what we said previously. So this is independently determinable. This is known. So therefore, we find this. So we find using this kind of process the real part of G of X. So this is uh, how you get the real part of G of X. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, this doesn't. This almost completely fixes the phase. It doesn't completely uh, fix the phase uh, because. Uh, so remember, we also know mod of g of x squared. Okay? So because we know mod of g of x squared, this is known, and using what I just explained, uh, the real part of g of x is known. You can almost get the imaginary part of g of x up to a sign. Okay, uh, this sign uh, can actually be determined, but I'm not gonna go through it uh, in, in the lecture. Uh, I will refer you uh, uh, to this paper uh, that we wrote with General Moli and Olga, uh, where it was explained how to find the sign. Uh, but you, know, uh, you see that you've almost entirely determined the phase up to an ambiguity of an order of two. Uh, and this ambiguity can be fixed with a little bit more work, uh, and uh, that's explained in this paper. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, you see that you can, you, you, you know, I hope this all already persuades you that you can almost entirely get g of x. Uh, and if you do a little bit more work, you can entirely get not only the magnitude but also the phase of g of x. Okay. So the punchline is very simple. The punchline is that you know we argued that this information is, you know, we argued that information is available in this time band from zero to epsilon. Uh, but the fact that this information about some low energy excitations is available to these ob observers who live in this time band zero to epsilon. Okay. The fact that these observers who live here can determine what's happening inside uh, is not some abstract statement within, uh, you know, that's based on operator algebras or some, you know, some, von Neumann, some proof about von Neumann algebras. It's a very physical statement. Okay, so these observers really physically, these observers can determine the bulk state. Okay. Now, what we've proved is a, is, is a result that's weaker than the result we proved last time, right? Because last time we proved a more concrete result that saying that, you know, they could determine all states in the bulk, even if you had, you know, arbitrary states in the bulk and we had some argument for why the Hilbert space they could access was complete and so on. Here, we haven't done anything like that here. We've just started We've just said if you have a low energy state and you're given some priors, you know, you're already told that the state doesn't have high energy components and so on, and you have some detectors that are low energy detectors, or you can determine the bulk state, provided it is low, provided it's a low energy state. But it's a powerful result in some sense because you know there's no there's no debate here. You know, there's no there's no discussion here about, you know, oh, you know, are you worried about some some subtle property of von Neumann algebras or anything like that. Uh, this is just something which we are doing within low energy effective field theory. So everything I said uh, from the beginning of this lecture uh, was entirely uh, within the context of low energy effective field theory. And uh, what I've shown you is that these observers can determine this bulk state using only low energy effective field theory. So this is an important point. You know, the fact that this principle of holography of information is not just abstract, but it's really physical. Okay. 
Uh, good. So I'm actually going to move on uh, to talk about flat space next, but if there are any questions about this part, uh, I will take them now and then otherwise we'll uh, shift gears and we'll talk about flat space. In fact, this entire ADS discussion was in a sense a warm up for flat space because in the end we're interested in the information paradox for flat space evaporating black holes. And we were doing ADS just because, you know, we knew what we should have got using ADS CFT. And for these kinds of toy experiments, as we just did, it's useful to have an IR cutoff. We don't have to worry as wasn't asked in the questions about super translations and so on, uh, which we will have to worry about next. Uh, but before I go to all of that, uh, if there are any questions about the ADS part, uh, I can take them now. Uh, otherwise we'll go on to discuss flat space. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. So, so in order to determine this get G state beyond, we are only asking binary questions. I mean, is it X or not something like that? Oh. No, no, no. So, uh, no, no, we're asking more. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I, I didn't emphasize that. Um, you see, uh, uh, so if you can measure, you see, it, it was just, maybe I didn't emphasize this enough. You see, if you can measure, uh, the point of this was, um, uh, if you know GX for X ranging over a basis, then you know G completely because you just choose your basis and you know the component on every, you know, you know, you know the overlap on the state on every element of a basis. So that's how you completely know G. So in the warm up task, I asked only a binary question was G X or was it not X? Uh, but then here I went on to the full task of characterizing G and maybe I went to it through fast. Uh, you know, the point here was I wanted to determine G of X. So I gave you a protocol that allowed you to determine G of X mod squared. And then I spent some time trying to explain how you would get the phase G of X. Uh, I actually didn't explain it completely. I said you could get the phase up to an ambiguity of two. Uh, but if you believe me that that ambiguity can be fixed and it can be fixed, then you can get the overlap of G, the mod and you know the, uh, the magnitude and the phase within, with a complete basis. And uh, that's, that's enough. That tells you the full state G. Uh, now, the reason it's only low energy is because this X, the set of low energy Hermitian operators only generates low energy states in the bulk. So this X runs, runs over a basis, but runs over a basis for the low energy space. And that's how you determine the whole, uh, the whole state. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But what about uh, if, if the, if our observer wants to uh, measure the higher, whether the, whether there is a black hole or not. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that in, uh, so you know, in principle, you could have started, you could try and extend this protocol to something much more complicated. And the argument we made last time was in principle, if you allow these observers to determine, you know, to measure arbitrarily complicated operators. So if they could turn on these sources, E to the IGX for very complicated operators, then they would also be able to determine what was happening if there was a black hole or not. So, you know, the argument we made last time was some abstract argument saying, if you look at the set of all observables in this time band zero to epsilon, then in the theory of gravity, you know, you can determine everything. So if you say that these observers can access all observables in this time band zero to epsilon, then in principle, we prove some formal statement that they could also determine a black hole microstate. Uh, the objective of the past hour was just to say that it's not just a formal statement. Here is something you can just forget about all the formal statements we made, and you can just work within low energy effective field theory, and you will already find that they can get a lot of information as here about low energy states. So even in low energies, you know, you will see that gravity stores information very differently from local quantum field theories. Um, uh, and that's something already to remember, you know, when, when you see, uh, if you see people talk about entanglement in the vacuum of the inside of a ball and the outside of a ball in the theory of gravity, and people say, oh, you know, that should behave just the same way as local quantum field theories do, uh, then you already see that that's not true because, you know, uh, we see that uh, even at low energies, uh, things are different. Uh, so that, that was all I was saying today. You know, last time we proved a more powerful result using different techniques. Uh, what we used today was very simple. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's just a verification, you know, some of a, a fun thought experiment one can do to see that what we're doing makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay that's great. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Sorry. I'm still confused about the, about the second warm up problem. So yes. there we were, we were trying to find whether G is X or not. Right. Correct. And, uh, what you said is that all, all we need to do is measure the the coefficient of j square yes okay but the yes. coefficient of j square is just g uh, i mean it's an overlap between g and x right okay so if that coefficient is one then then uh, g is x otherwise it's uh, g is not x oh see, so it, yeah. the only two possibilities are not one and zero it can be in between right 
Yeah, yeah, it could be in V. So, so you know, the, the observers actually will determine the overlap of G and X, which is better than determining whether it's X or not. So they'll if right, it's, right, right. If, if it's half, if there's a half component on X, they will determine that as well. So they can determine the overlap of G with X. You're right. They can right. answer more than the binary question using this protocol, not just one and zero. Uh, so mm -hmm. they could have got the answer half. And then they would have said, you know, okay, you know, they, they will give you that answer. They will say, you know, it has an yeah, overlap. So for, in principle, they can say that G is almost like the state X, but not completely. And so on, so on. Absolutely. They can say that. Yes. Yeah. By using this protocol. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I, you know, the reason I gave the binary task is that in the local QFT, the binary task is impossible. You can't determine anything like the overlap, because if you look at X or U bulk on X, that's completely indistinguishable. So they can't even determine if it's X or if it's orthogonal to X. By act, right. in a local QFT, by acting with a bulk unitary, you can make the state orthogonal to X, and you can't, you know, there's no way you can determine that. But by measuring this energy at infinity, uh, you can see this. So, you know, this is kind of uh, making this point about how this, the fact that you can measure the energy at infinity is so powerful, uh, and uh, it's already evident in low energy effective field theory. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Fine. Okay, great. So let's uh, go on to talk about, about flat space. Uh, so I'm now going to shift gears uh, and talk about uh, flat space. Okay. So uh, let me just remind you uh, of uh, some. Let's see. No, no, yeah. Uh, let me just remind you of 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 uh, some basic things, some geometric preliminaries about flat space. I don't think we'll have time to do much more, other than just uh, recap some simple geometric preliminaries. Uh, so when what are the kinds of space times that we are going to discuss? I'm actually going to have to make some simplifications. Uh, I'm going to have to immediately specify uh, to um, specialize to four dimensions. Uh, perhaps not for anything I'll say in uh, in well, uh, maybe even for what I'll say in today's lecture. Uh, so uh, I'm going to have to specify uh, specialize to four dimensions, and that's because uh, you know there's been a lot of uh, developments in our understanding of how gravity works in flat space, uh, but a lot of those developments have been specific uh, to four dimensions. Um, I mean, there, there's some people who, who may be on the call who, who, you know, who've studied higher dimensional generalizations, and it's a very interesting question uh, to study everything uh, we are going to say here to higher dimensions. Uh, but for simplicity, uh, for today's lecture and for tomorrow's lecture, uh, we are going to specialize uh, to four dimensions, and hopefully, uh, the lessons that we learn uh, will generalize to higher dimensions as well. And I'll try and explain why we think that should be the case. Uh, but everything precise we'll do will be in four dimensions. Uh, so in four dimensions, and in four dimensions is interesting because of course it is our world. So you know it's not like four dimensions is in some uninteresting uh, corner of uh, the parameter space. And so we want to consider uh, space times that have the property that they're asymptotically flat. Okay? And when we say they're asymptotically flat, we mean the following. We mean that the metric uh, goes to this. Uh, oops. Uh, if you go off uh, to r equal to infinity, the metric goes to this, okay? uh, where gamma AB, this is a round metric on the two sphere. This A and B, if you don't like, you can just think of as being theta and phi on the sphere. Uh, there's another, uh, in other parts of the literature, people use holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates on the sphere. So you can use Z and Z bar, or you can use just a theta and phi as we learned in high school. I actually never went beyond that. So I, I, I like to use theta and phi uh, for simplicity, but holomorphic coordinates are, are, are good as well. Uh, and uh, uh, so in any case, whatever coordinates you use, gamma AB is the is a round metric on the sphere. Uh, and this U is what we would usually call T minus R in Minkowski space. Okay. So that's why uh, I've written the metric in this form. Uh, and uh, the uh, this uh, 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 this uh, metric that I've written actually parametrizes uh, because I've taken the R goes to infinity limit. Uh, what is a future null infinity uh, in the space time? Okay, so let me just draw uh, the Penrose diagram. Okay, um, this should be a diamond. Maybe I'll try and do better. Let's try. Uh, Okay, I can't do better. Anyway, so so uh, please please imagine this is a diamond and excuse my poor drawing skills. Uh, so on uh, so uh, this space we are parametrizing is is here uh, is is this is this region? Sorry, 
Uh, so the coordinate system we have written down is good for uh, this this part of of null infinity. This is u goes to plus infinity. This is u goes to minus infinity. Okay, and at every point in this Penrose diagram, uh, we have a, a two sphere, and of course r uh, is the usual r on the Penrose diagram. Okay, so this is scry plus. Uh, this future null infinity is as usual uh, denoted by scry plus, and uh, there is a, a sense in which you can talk about uh, the past of future null infinity, which is the region region here, which is u goes to minus infinity, and this past of null infinity uh, we will denote by scry plus minus with this minus here. Uh, everything uh, we say about future null infinity. Uh, there is a parallel statement that one can make for past null infinity. So these coordinates that I've written down are called uh, retarded Bondi coordinates. Uh, there's an analogous set of coordinates where you could talk about advanced coordinates, and then th those would be good for specifying for you know describing physics on past null infinity. Uh, and uh, similarly, on past null infinity, there is a future of past null infinity, which is sometimes called i minus plus. Uh, but I want to emphasize uh, just one thing. I'm sure all of you have seen this Penrose diagram. Uh, but one thing that's uh, perhaps uh, not always emphasized is that you know uh, that this fields at the future of past null infinity are not continuous and do not continuously go over to fields at future null infinity. Okay, so fields here at this point when I write here are not continuous. So, you know, we are going to make some statements which are going to be true for future null infinity, uh, and you should be careful that this coordinate system that we have stops at the past boundary of future null infinity when past boundary is given by i plus minus, and things don't just smoothly carry over into past null infinity. A uh, past null infinity and future null infinity are, are separate, uh, and you know the connection between them is this blow up of spatial infinity, uh, which we are not going to talk about. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Uh, so that is uh, one thing I wanted to say just about the Penrose diagram uh, and the and the coordinates. Uh, let me say uh, right uh, and maybe a reference, a good reference uh, to see all of this. I'm going to go. Through, I'm I'm only going to say some things that are that are relevant for us. A good reference to read more about this is Strominger's lecture notes uh, on the infrared structure of gauge series and gravity. In particular, uh, Strominger will explain nicely in the beginning of those lecture notes why fields at the future boundary of past null infinity are not the same as fields at the past boundary of future null infinity, why you need to distinguish i minus plus from i plus minus, uh, and that you can see very simply uh, just by taking the fields of a moving point charge and by saying that you know those limits are not the same. Okay? So there's a sense in which past null infinity is different, and it has to be different uh, because that's going that's a different Hilbert space and a different Fox space, as we'll say, uh, and future null infinity is different. Okay. Okay. Um, very good. Okay. Let me say one more thing about this Penrose diagram. Uh, in the GR literature, it's often well, may maybe just here. In the GR literature, it's uh, you know people often say this Penrose diagram defines non-black hole space times. Okay. Uh, when in our discussion, we are going to assume that even if you have black holes which are formed in the bulk, the black holes evaporate always, and so this describes also black hole space times and that's because for us we are going to assume that black holes evaporate so you know in this is different i want to emphasize from the formal gr treatment of these penrose diagrams and of asymptotically flat space times uh, where uh, you know they're very careful to say that uh, you know, uh, this is uh, the Penrose diagram of some of some region or some asymptotically flat space time uh, that does not have black holes. Uh, but uh, and and you know, it's indeed true that if you have a black hole and you consider only classical GR, uh, then in classical GR the Penrose diagram is of course different, as we pointed out. You know, as we we've, we've drawn this Penrose diagram in the past, and uh, you know, if you had classical GR, then the Penrose diagram of a black hole would be different uh, from the Penrose diagram uh, that we have on top, this diamond. Uh, but uh, the moment you take Hawking radiation into account, uh, you expect that you know things will eventually evaporate, and therefore, if you you know if you wait long enough, if you wait for time scales which are longer than the evaporation time of the the black hole, uh, you eventually return to flat space. Uh, we can still ask questions about whether you know you return to flat space in a way that information is outside or not. 
Uh, but in the end, we agree that you return to flat space. Maybe you have some massive particles that go off to uh, uh, go off uh, here. Uh, but uh, you know, apart from that, uh, things still return to asymptotically flat space. And therefore, I should clarify that whenever we draw this diagram, we will allow all kinds of excitations in the bulk, including black hole excitations. Uh, but the assumption we are making is that things evaporate, and therefore you don't need to consider this kind of Penrose diagram. Okay, okay. Uh, very good. Uh, now I need to specify a little bit more about the boundary conditions uh, that we're going to specify on what kinds of excitations we can have. Uh, so let me say a little bit about boundary conditions. Uh, as usual, when you specify boundary conditions, it's most easy to specify the boundary conditions in a gauge. Uh, in ADS also, if you remember, we specify the boundary conditions by choosing Pfefferman Graham gauge. Uh, in flat space, it's conventional to choose what's called Bondi gauge. Okay? And Bondi gauge uh, is chosen by saying that GRR and GRA, remember these are two sphere directions, uh, is just zero all the time. So it was zero in the leading asymptotically flat space term, uh, but we're just going to say that, you know, whatever fluctuation you have, uh, you choose gauge or you make a change of coordinates so that GRR and GRA are always zero. And you can always do this by making a coordinate change. So even if you have some fluctuation that takes you away from the metric, you, can, you choose a new radial coordinate, make some transformation in the sphere uh, so that these things uh, become zero. And then there's another condition you need to fix because uh, you need to have four conditions. And the other condition uh, in Bondi gauge is specified to be this, okay? that this determinant of GAB divided by R squared is zero. Okay? Uh, so this is roughly the statement that the coefficient that appears out in front of you know, the, the D omega squared metric, uh, the leading part of that, uh, you know, that, that, that's R squared. Uh, but more precisely, what we've said is if you take the determinant of that gamma AB, you're allowed to vary the components of gamma AB. But if you take the determinant of that gamma AB, uh, that uh, you know uh, is is r squared or is r squared up to some constant. Okay, so in this gauge, this is called Bondi gauge, uh, and uh, uh, it's we, the only reason we are choosing Bondi gauge is because uh, this is uh, something that's uh, used conventionally. Uh, we don't you know you could choose different gauges. Uh, for more on the Bondi gauge, uh, once again, uh, there's Strominger's lecture notes, but there's also a nice review by. A Jeffrey compare, uh, which I will refer you to. So uh, if you look at this review, uh, you will again uh, find more description uh, of uh, the Bondi gauge conditions uh, and more detailed description of everything uh, that we are saying here. Okay. So in this gauge, uh, the boundary conditions that we will choose are just conventional boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions we are going to choose is that, remember, so we fixed GRR and GRA, but there are many other components of the metric and they are allowed to vary. And the way we allow them to vary is that we say that, look, the leading term has to be fixed. This is the leading term. Okay? And this leading term has to be fixed to be minus one. We are not going to allow fluctuations that are so large that they change the leading term, but we will allow fluctuations that can change the sub-leading term. And in particular, we will allow fluctuations that will create an order of one over R excitation. Okay? Once again, the choice of these boundary conditions is basically made so that you don't choose boundary conditions that are too restrictive so that you kill radiation or you know you kill uh, interesting bulk states uh, but you don't make boundary conditions that are so uh, you know that are so liberal uh, that you allow uh, excitations which destroy the asymptotic structure and then you can't say much about the physics okay uh, so that's where uh, this choice of boundary conditions uh, comes from and a, a lot of effort and time has been spent on trying to understand what are the right boundary conditions to use uh, we are just using the boundary conditions that are conventionally chosen uh, to define asymptotically flat space times. Uh, and this is the condition on GUU. Uh, there's a similar condition on GUR, which is chosen to be this. And then there are conditions on com metric components which go along the sphere. In fact, this is order one. So GUA is order one. And we allow GAB. Remember, the leading term is fixed to be R square into gamma AB. And then we allow an order R fluctuation. Okay. Uh, so these are the boundary conditions that we allow for allowed fluctuations. Uh, there's an analog of uh, this in ADS as well. Remember when we said we were working with ADS, we said we'll work with normalizable boundary conditions. Uh, there it was pretty simple to specify what those boundary conditions were. Uh, we just said, you know, you go to Pfefferman Graham gauge and then you specify that the fields die off to zero. Uh, here we have to be a little bit more careful. 
Uh, but these are conventional boundary conditions that are chosen uh, for asymptotically flat space types. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, once again, uh, I want to emphasize uh, that, uh, you know, um, well, let, let me just write one more thing and then I'll say a little bit more. So you can ask what are the set of space times that are consistent with these boundary conditions? And the general set of space times you can find is this. Uh, so this is the leading term. This the term I'm writing right now is just the the leading Minkowski space term. Okay. Plus, you can have twice m over r. This remember the GUU component was allowed to have a one over r fluctuation. The GAB component remember was allowed to have an r fluctuation. Remember, notice that even though this looks like it's large, it's smaller compared to this, which is r squared. Okay. And then. Uh, you find that uh, this component, the UA component is in fact fixed in terms of the AB component to be this. And this in fact comes from demanding, making some, you know, putting some demands on the while tensor. And I'm going to uh, refer you to exercise 10 of uh, Strominger's lecture notes. Uh, the fact that the UA component is fixed uh, in terms of the uh, AB component uh, comes basically by ensuring that the wild tensor has certain fall off properties at infinity. Uh, so we want asymptotically flat space times to have a wild tensor that behaves correctly. Uh, if you do that, uh, then you find that the UA component is fixed. So you might have thought that there was another independent component that you could write here, uh, but you can't if you want, uh, you know, if you put boundary conditions, not only the ones I demanded previously, but also conditions on the wild tensor. And so you find that you have this CAB and you have this M. And then of course there are other components you can write down, uh, which I haven't written down. And so this expansion is only valid at large R. And if you start going to smaller and smaller R or somewhere in the bulk, the metric could be arbitrarily complicated. In fact, you could continue this expansion itself uh, to subleading components in R, uh, but we will not need that, okay? Okay, uh, let me just specify a little bit, uh, explain a little bit what these components that we have written down are. This component CAB is called the shear. It's called the shear and notice that it must be symmetric. It must be symmetric because it's multiplying omega A times omega B, so there's no anti-symmetric part. And you can check that the Bondi gauge condition forces it also to be traceless. Okay. Okay. So it's a two cross two tensor, which is symmetric and traceless. So it has two independent components. That just comes from the fact that the CAB uh, is, that's just the fact that if you have a two tensor, uh, you have a tensor in, in two dimensions. Uh, it's symmetric and traceless. It has only two independent components. Uh, these two independent components are in fact very physical and they are uh, of great interest uh, because these two components in fact contain information about the two physical components of the gravity uh, corresponding to radiation that's going far away. So this contains information about the two polarizations of outgoing radiation. So the fact that you have two components here, uh, the, you know, we, we know you have gravitons, you have, gravitons, you have gravity, uh, you have gravity waves. Uh, these gravity waves can have two possible polarizations and these two possible polarizations, uh, the information about their amplitudes lives inside the CAB. In fact, it's often convenient not to talk about CAB directly, uh, but to talk about what's called NAB, which you will hear often. Uh, and this NAB is called the Bondi news. Okay. Okay. So NAB is called the Bondi news uh, and it's convenient often to talk of NAB uh, rather than CAB, uh, but you could also speak in terms of CAB. Okay. Uh, I should have emphasized of course that CAB, M, NAB, they're all functions of u and omega. So it's not like uh, when we wrote uh, this expansion here uh, that these terms were just some constants, uh, you know, they, they're interesting functions that vary uh, all over future null infinity in various interesting ways that we'll be interested in. Okay. 
Now, uh, I explained here, if you saw this, if you look at this expression, uh, you see that these terms are just the leading terms. So they're not, I mean, they're, they're important, but they, they're not giving us any dynamical information. And then there is this CAB and there is also this term M. So there are only two components here. There are only two new variables or two new quantities that we've introduced here. One is CAB, which I just described as telling you about the fluctuations of gravity waves far away. Uh, and then there's this M and this M is called the Bondi mass aspect. Called the Bondi mass aspect, and related to this Bondi mass aspect, you can integrate this Bondi mass aspect on the two sphere at infinity. And if you were to do that, um, then this quantity is called the Bondi mass. Okay. So physically, the Bondi mass is doing something uh, that's pretty simple to understand. Okay. The Bondi mass, notice, is now only a function of u. Uh, even though M was a function of U and the sphere, I obtained the Bondi mass by doing an integral uh, over the entire sphere. And so the Bondi mass obviously is only a function of U. And what the Bondi mass is telling us is actually the following. It's telling us that, so if you look at the Bondi mass U at some point U, it's telling us how much mass remains to be radiated, okay? How much mass remains or remains to be radiated or how much mass remains inside? Okay. So I hope what M of U is doing is clear. So what it's telling us is uh, in these orange lines, which are the, the lines that go uh, from uh, up to the future boundary of uh, null infinity, uh, it's telling us how much uh, uh, mass remains inside. And so this is the cut U, okay? And this is what M of U is telling us. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, I should also say one more thing about M of U. Of course, you can ask what happens to M of U as you start going to the past. So I said M of U is telling you how much mass remains inside. And I can, you can ask, you know, what happens if, if you just take M of U to the past boundary of future null infinity? And you can guess what happens there. If you take the limit as U goes to minus infinity of M of U, this just becomes H, which is the ADM Hamiltonian in flat space. Okay. So this just tells you, you know, if you start taking the limit of M of U to U goes to minus infinity, uh, that just tells you what's the total energy in the space time. So, you know, you have some space time uh, before that energy was radiated out, there was some total energy. Uh, you know, in some sense, if you look at the ADM Hamiltonian, you go far away, that energy is just conserved. Uh, and uh, this limit as U goes to minus infinity of M of U, which is M of U at this point, remember this is U goes to minus infinity uh, is just given by the ADM Hamiltonian, okay? Okay, uh, we later also have occasion to discuss the U goes to minus infinity of the mass aspect, uh, but for now we only need the U goes to minus infinity limit of M of U. Okay. Uh, now, apart uh, from the metric, so far I've described uh, the metric, uh, but of course, uh, you know, if you want to discuss interesting physics, uh, we want to discuss other kinds of fields. Uh, so, uh, in uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, you might have other kinds of massless fields. Uh, so, there are similar boundary conditions you can impose for other fields. Uh, so other fields, uh, there are similar boundary conditions. Uh, just to be simple, uh, let's think of a scalar field. So let's say you have a bulk scalar field, then the boundary condition we are going to put in that scalar field is just that it dies off as one over R and this is its boundary value. Uh, so this is very much uh, like what we were doing in ADS, where we said, if you have some scalar field, a massless scalar field, it dies off as one by R to the Delta. And then there's some boundary value uh, here. The field dies off as one over R and there's some boundary value O and that O is a function of both U and Omega. And that just tells you uh, what the boundary of the scalar field is. There are similar conditions one can put for gauge fields, uh, which again, I'll refer you to the references uh, to, to find out. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, there, of course, in a more realistic theory, one could also have massive fields. And that's uh, one thing maybe I should say here, and then we can conclude this discussion. In, so we could also have, in realistic theories, we could have massive fields. Uh, but we will not actually 
be able to discuss in the lectures today and tomorrow uh, anything to do with, with massive fields. And uh, the reason is that massive fields, so fields with mass, so these fields, uh, they die off faster than any polynomial power of R as we approach scribe, as we approach future null infinity. Again, similarly, at past null infinity. Okay. Uh, so uh, massive fields, in fact, are well described at future time-like and past time-like infinity. Okay. So there's a sense in which if you look at massive particles, they never reach scry plus or scry minus, but they come from past time-like infinity, which is the small i minus, and they go to scry plus. So massive field, if you plot the world line of some massive particle, it does something of this kind. Okay. It starts from here and it goes up here. And so massive fields do not have a good description at either scry plus or scry minus. And you know, in what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a lot about, about scry plus and equivalently about scry minus. And so we will actually not have so much to say about massive particles uh, because massive particles uh, just don't appear at scry plus. Okay. Now you might've thought that this is a significant, uh, you know, this is a, a, some, a, a significant concession that we are only going to talk about massless fields. Uh, but in fact, uh, because uh, the objective of what we're going to say is to discuss black holes, uh, this is not such a significant concession because if we take a very large black hole, okay, so consider a very large black hole, and that's in fact the limit in which we are going to be interested uh, in, um, uh, in, in black holes because you already always want to consider black holes that are very, very large to start with, that are parametrically large to start with, then most of its radiation is in massless particles. Okay. And that's because it just doesn't radiate particles which are massive because the temperature of the black hole, remember, is one over the radius up to some constants. And provided this radius, this temperature is smaller than the mass of the smallest particle, uh, the black hole effectively does not radiate in massive particles at all. And therefore, you know, it is still a good thing, or it still gives you a fair amount of information uh, to talk about massless particles. Uh, that being said, it would be very nice, uh, you know, to extend everything that we're going to say uh, in the next lecture, uh, also to discuss massive particles. Uh, but uh, even though we'll only discuss massless particles, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find that, uh, you know, you, we'll have to reduce over this the set of massive particles. Uh, that might still be a useful description uh, for black holes uh, for this reason. Uh, and that is that a very large black hole uh, for most of its lifetime simply doesn't radiate uh, massive particles. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so actually uh, we are uh, out of time. Uh, and so this is a good, uh, a good place uh, to stop here. Uh, let me just recap everything I said about flat space. In fact, I haven't said anything uh, that's not already available in the standard literature. Let me just remind you uh, what I said. I'll go back to the uh, old badly drawn Penrose diagram, maybe. Uh, so I said, you know, we are talking about flat space. We have this uh, parameterization of flat space in terms of these, these Bondi coordinates. Um, and uh, we have said that the leading part of this flat space is just Minkowski. Uh, in the bulk, we allow uh, all kinds of fluctuations, uh, but then uh, we put some boundary conditions on those fluctuations. I specified what those boundary conditions were. Uh, that was here. Uh, you can parameterize the fluctuations of the metric in terms of what's called the shear uh, and in terms of what's called the Bondi mass. Uh, the shear, in fact, is what tells you about the dynamical components of the graviton. In fact, more commonly than the shear, uh, it's the Bondi news uh, that's discussed that tells you about the, the radiation that goes out. And then there is uh, another component which is constrained, which we'll discuss tomorrow, which is the Bondi mass aspect and its integral, which is the Bondi mass. Uh, which tells you how much mass remains here, and that controls another component of the metric. Uh, similarly, for other massless fields, there are other boundary conditions you can put, and we are not going to discuss massive particles uh, in this discussion in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, so I'll stop here, and we can see if there are questions. Yeah, actually, there's a raise hand. Maybe. Yeah, sure, go on, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a quick, a quick question, and I think uh, it's clear from, from this slide, but 
Um, if we see this Minkowski space as um, as a closed quantum system or something, what what is exactly meant by um, uh, by by uh, mass radiating away to infinity? Uh, you're right. Uh, you should think of Minkowski space as being a closed as being a closed uh, system. And so, you know, if you think of evolution on Cauchy slices, you see Cauchy slices always start and end at a space like infinity. So Cauchy slice always does this. So if you think of evolution, the evolution is unitary along slices that do something like this. Okay. Uh, so it is, it is a, it is a, it is a closed system. And if you do time evolution and you keep track of this, these slices always go off, go off here. They always end, you know, they don't end at null infinity. Uh, and so they, they appear here, but you know, uh, there, there's a sense in which, uh, you know, it is, it is useful to talk about radiation. That's, you know, a lot of this terminology, a lot of this formalism was developed to understand gravitational waves. And it is useful to talk about gravitational radiation in that if you had an observer somewhere here, uh, you know, how much radiation would, would, you know, if you observers and we see some event that happened in the past, uh, how much radiation would cross us at a given time. And that's where, you know, that's why all of these things are related to gravitational wave radiation. Uh, but uh, you're right that in, in the description that we are talking about, we'd like to talk in terms of Cauchy slices. In terms of Cauchy slices, all of null infinity, all of future null infinity is in fact like a limit of the Cauchy slice. So you know, the state of the field, so all of future null infinity gives you, uh, it's like a limit of these Cauchy slices that are tending up and up. And so in a local quantum field here, you need to specify the state of fields so on all of null infinity to tell you the state. And there is no information loss in that description because you're always describing evolution on these kinds of slices as I've drawn here. So this is, you know, on these slices, the evolution is always unitary and, and you're right, the energy is conserved on these slices, you know, the energy doesn't, and that's because, you know, if you measure the energy here, you're always measuring the U goes to minus infinity limit of uh, the Bondi mass, you know, you're never measuring, you know, uh, if you try to measure the, the Bondi mass at a cut, you'd be somehow measuring how much energy remains on, let me try and see if I can draw, uh, how much energy remains on on this part of the, the slice. Do you see the green part? Which is not, you know, which excludes some of the slice. So it's like, you know, it's like looking at some part of the, this, the region and not looking at the outside of that region. Uh, so you could ask of how much radiation has crossed over from the green region to the outside of the green region. And that's roughly what MOFU is telling you. MOFU is telling you how much uh, mass remains inside. Uh, but you're right, if you take the entire slice, the energy is of course conserved. Does that answer the question? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see that R Rifat has a question. Uh, do you, uh, uh, so the question is, aren't black holes classically defined as regions of space-time that are causally disconnected from future null infinity and in semi-classical gravity, wouldn't the same definition uh, carry out? Otherwise, we are concluding that there is no black hole by the original definition. Uh, but I think that, that is true, that you know, if, you, if you take a definition of a black hole, uh, horizon as strictly uh, you know, being the causal past, or, you know, being, being the boundary, uh, be, being a causal boundary, then you're right that, you know, if black holes evaporate, there's no sense in which uh, such regions uh, exist. So, um, uh, you know, we, we'd like to ask questions about whether the evolution is, is unitary or not. Uh, but, you know, if you try and take a strict GR definition of an event horizon, then you're right that event horizons don't exist in quantum gravity. And I mean, the fact that you have Hawking evaporation and the fact that black holes evaporate uh, tells you that strictly speaking, you don't have anything like an event horizon. I, I don't know if there's a follow-up or if this answers the question. If there's a follow-up, I'd be happy to answer. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, just to say once again, you know, there's a sense, of course, in which you have, you have objects where you have, you, you know, uh, you, you, have, you have black hole formation, uh, but to characterize a black hole in a theory of quantum gravity, you would not be able to characterize it by using a strict mathematical definition of an event horizon, because uh, clearly, you know, since once black holes evaporate, uh, you don't have that notion any longer. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, there are no raised yeah. hands also, right? Sorry, is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got another, another question. And maybe um, uh, I asked it yesterday in a tutorial with uh, John Ramuli uh, as well, but. I'm a bit confused with the principle uh, of holography. Um, what, a, what, for example, uh, a bulk observer would um, uh, would observe. So, so if we have an, some observer who's living inside the space time, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we're we're getting to to this, but I'm just out of interest. But, but, 
so, so uh, yeah, actually, I'm not sure we, we'll, we'll get to that. If the question you're asking is, you know, does the observer observe the observer, uh, you know, does the observer observe the observer? So, you know, the, all of these things we're talking about, but uh, uh, so, you know, uh, you're right that in, in general, if you want to ask questions about gravity in a cosmological setting, uh, you need to go, you know, the standard framework of quantum mechanics is defined so that you have a notion of an observer and there's a system that the observer is, is separate from. Uh, and uh, in what we talked about here, like this, these astrophysicists, we talked about, you know, the astrophysicists were measuring some state, uh, maybe the first diagram I drew. Uh, you know, they were measuring some state, but they were not trying to measure themselves. Uh, so there's some, there's some sense in which they're, they're able to measure the interior of ADS, uh, but they are separate uh, from the interior of ADS. Uh, so um, if, if that is a question, I mean, maybe we'll have a little bit more to say about it when we discuss infalling observers and black holes. Uh, but that's really not a question that we have a, a good framework to answer uh, because everything that we said here, you know, when we said you make a measurement or when we say you act with a unitary, uh, in principle, that always, you know, when you talk about making a measurement, the understanding of measurement is, you know, you, you entangle the system with some pointer, with some detector, and then you have decoherence. And that's what you mean by making a measurement. Uh, but in a cosmological setting, you know, you live in one universe and there's no, there's no really good description of what one means by making a measurement or what one means by uh, you know, acting with unitaries and so on. So there must be some sense in which all of these things are approximately well-defined. So there must be some sense in which, you know, if you set up some ADS in, on the tabletop or set up some approximate ADS, there's a sense in which you could be external to it and you could make measurements. Uh, but you could also ask a deeper question about, you know, what does it mean for an observer who's part of the system to make measurements? And uh, that's actually a very good question to which I think we don't actually have a good answer because the framework of quantum mechanics is not developed to do that. So in what we're doing here, we're just taking some, you know, textbook quantum mechanics interpretation where we have some observers who can measure what's happening inside ADS or what's happening inside flat space and can somehow separate themselves from what's happening. Uh, but you could ask if they can really separate themselves and, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe yeah, later we'll discuss this issue of state dependent operators and whether that has a role, but there's no very clear or clean answer to that question. Uh, and that's because I think, you know, uh, quantum mechanics was not developed with such pictures in mind where we ask questions. So what happens to a system if we measure it from the inside rather than measuring it from the outside? Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's a very hard and a very interesting question, but you know, we, we're just going to use the standard rules of quantum mechanics where we say the observers can somehow separate themselves and measure the rest of the system. I don't know if that's very satisfactory, but that's the best well, answer. We have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just um, is it then that, that you're that, that you're saying, for example, that that, that an observer in a bulk space time uh, can at least we don't know uh, at the moment, but but can never determine whether a black hole uh, evaporates unitarily or something. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Go on, please. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, just let me say one, one more thing before that. The, the moment you have quantum mechanics, you have to be, you already, for instance, need a notion of identically prepared systems, right? Because when we talked about measurements here, we talked about expectation values. So when you discuss a correlator, you're talking about expectation values, or we talked about probabilities here. So if you wanted to test if black hole evaporation was unitary, you would never be able to do it with one black hole. Uh, because with one black hole, you know, you would measure some correlators, but you would never be able to get information because even in simple quantum mechanical systems, you can't get information by doing one measurement. Uh, so if you want to test if black hole evaporation is unitary, you will have to have a sense in which, you know, you create some, some black holes in some, or you, you know, you have some condensed matter system or something that simulates a black hole. You can prepare it in identical states and then you can make measurements. So that's the only sense in which you can even ask uh, that question. Uh, so it, you see, you have to have uh, in these frameworks, a sense of being able to be external, being having access to identically prepared systems uh, and so on. Uh, if you just had one black hole in the universe and one set of observers, uh, these would not be meaningful questions to ask because you would never be able to test anything because in quantum mechanics, things are just probabilistic. So, uh, you know, so in some sense, the kind of setup you want to think about here is maybe I can go and, uh, or maybe here, let me just go back here. Uh, you know, is that, uh, uh, you know, is, is that you have some big space uh, and in this big space, you have like small regions of space and the observers like surround like small regions of space, right? So you have an observer here and you have an observer here and then later these observers can, can meet and can talk to each other. So, you know, you have like identically prepared systems, like these small circles are identically prepared systems. They're all part of a bigger space. Uh, and then, uh, you know, these observers make measurements in their small patch of space and then they meet. 
but uh, if that doesn't work, then you know the entire language that we have of describing measurements and and physics doesn't work. Uh, I mean, we'll have to uh, refine that. So we somehow are assuming that 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 will work. There's a sense in which you can say we all part of a bigger space that and these smaller circles might have black holes or might have other excitations, uh, but they're all embedded in a bigger space. And therefore, you, you know, uh, we can talk of these observers who live in the bigger space who are external to these smaller spaces. Right, thank you. Very clear. Yes, thanks. <laughs>